Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you. Hoosiers are preparing their gardens and hoping for a bountiful harvest. And Earth Eats Annie Corrigan is here to celebrate. Journey with Annie as she ventures into the local food movement, meeting farmers and sharing her favorite seasonal recipes. It's all coming up right now on the weekly specials, Earth Eats Extravaganza. Welcome to the weekly special, I'm Erica Sagone. Well, for the last eight years, WFIU's Annie Corrigan, host of the Earth Eats radio program, has shared stories from across the state inspired by local food and sustainable agriculture. Now, Annie, along with other leaders in the local food movement, have compiled those stories and recipes into a brand new book, Earth Eats, Real Food, Green Living. She's here to tell us about it, but first, let's take a look at one of the recipes featured. So we spoke with a bunch of our listeners and we said, what foods do you want us to cook with? Almost unanimously, people said squash. We need squash recipes. Mm -hmm. So it looks like that's what we're doing today. This is squash. This is actually a spaghetti squash. All right. And there's several different ways to cook it. Um, what I like to do when I'm cooking it in a conventional oven is I'll just cut it in half. Woo! Using some muscle. Okay, and it does have kind of a thick skin. Okay, and you can see how when we pull these seeds out, though these little strings almost like spaghetti that come out. Okay, and that's why they call it obviously spaghetti squash. Now you can toast these seeds and uh, eat them. I know as a kid I always, you know, would want mom to do that. Put your spaghetti squash cut side down, put about a half inch of water in there, and then roast it in the oven at about, I would say, 375 for about 40, 45 minutes. When you roast it whole, uh, you need to stick it, stick it with a knife a couple times so it doesn't explode. And you can even cook this in the microwave. And a lot of times what I'll do is, when I cook it like this, I'll just cut out a little window into it. Okay, we'll pull that into a bowl. And then you can, you could uh, season it with whatever you like. Um, if you like red sauce, anything that you would do with spaghetti. If you like red sauce, you could do red sauce. Um, what I'm gonna do is toss it with some Parmesan cheese, a little salt, a little chopped garlic, a little lemon zest, a little pepper, maybe a little crushed red pepper flakes. Okay, and then I'm gonna use some truffle oil, but you could just use regular extra virgin olive oil and then you could stuff it back into the shell. Take oh, it to the clever. table like this. Garnish it with a little bit of parsley. Maybe a little sprinkle of Parmesan on top. I'm a big fan of spaghetti squash. I gotta say, I've never made it like this, but I definitely use it as a replacement for pasta uh -huh. in some dishes. Delicious. Ooh, those red pepper flakes. You can learn more about real food and green living on the Earth Eats website, print off recipes, read the latest in food news, and subscribe to our weekly podcast. It's all available at eartheats.org. Well, my stomach is definitely growling after watching that. It looks delicious. Well, thank you, Annie, so much for joining us. Uh, really excited to delve into the cookbook here. Yeah, glad to be here. Uh, I got to ask, you know, after eight years of hosting the radio program, why a book? Good question. <laughs> We are a radio show and a, and a blog, so it was very odd at first to have this physical thing that I can hold and touch, that I can dog ear and come back to and take with me into the garden, but it just feels like the natural progression that people can actually hold this thing, get it dirty in the kitchen, take it with them into the garden, and you know, jumpstart their local food lives. That's what I tried to do with the book. Well, Annie, there are obviously dozens of seasonal recipes in this book, but you've also spent a lot of time going out into communities and talking with the local farmers and including their stories in this book. Why is it important to share their stories? 
Well, personally, I just really love meeting new people and, and learning about what my community mates do with their time. And also, with something as important as food, it's good to see how your food grows, to see exactly what they put on the fields, how they pull it out of the ground, how they drive it to the market. You know, the nuts and bolts of eating food is important. Yeah. You're a local foodie. Um, I mean, why do you think it's important to know where your food comes well, from? Well, I think it's important, but I also think it's fun. I like to know the story behind um, the food, the people, the technique, you know, where they got their ingredients. You know, when I think of local farmers, I think of the farmer's market. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's a great place to interact with farmers. Yes. But I'm always intimidated about, you know, what should I ask them about their food? Do you have any tips of how I should approach, approach a farmer at a market? Well, uh, I guess my number one piece of advice is they want to talk. They want to interact. They're very proud of what they've grown, and they will give you advice on how to cook it. I don't know how many great recipes I've come up with because a farmer has given me suggestions. So just ask them, when did you pick this? Mm -hmm. How did you grow it? Something as open-ended as that can really start a great conversation. That is such great advice. Well, many farmers that Annie speaks to share a passion for green living, and we had the opportunity to meet one such family who has made it their mission to deliver healthy food from happy animals. Hello, hello, hello! <laughs> Aren't they awesome? <laughs> I can't decide if they're like the cutest things ever or like the most ridiculously ugly things ever. It's, it depends on the day. And for owner Mandy Napier, it takes a lot of days and a lot of hard work to raise 650 turkeys. When the farm was started, the only formal education I had was um, a master's in social work, um, which was not really all that helpful in this, so I spent a lot of time reading and talking with other folks. One thing that we did that was very wise was to start small. Right now I have a thousand laying hens. When we first started, we had 25. So starting small, and in that, the freedom to try a lot of new things, a lot of different things to see what worked best for us. Part of my draw to the farm was just to be able to eat based on my own convictions, and part of that, if I was going to raise them, was to raise them based on my own convictions. And so for me, that meant wanting to do right by them. I just looked at what they did naturally and provided an environment for them to do that instead of cramming them into an unnatural environment and then compensating for their unhappiness and lack of thriftiness by having to treat them, medicate them, and that sort of thing. So they were happy. They did grow. They did produce well. They didn't need any aid from us. It was more about smart, good, sound management practices, just being good caretakers. And in that, they thrived, and, and we have too. Each year when baby turkeys are old enough, they're released to pasture, moving from one temporary pin to the next grazing on 12 acres of farm by Thanksgiving. You can see the feeders up here on the hill and also the water is over there and some shelters. Everything is portable, so they have everything they need here and hopefully that means they stay where they're supposed to be. <laughs> These turkeys are a broad-breasted bronze. They're a cross between the conventional white broad-breasted bird and the standard heritage bronze bird. I really like this cross because they have the instinct to forage like a heritage bird does, but they also produce a more plump carcass, like what people want. I think the meat from our birds tastes different than conventionally raised birds because they're out on pasture, and that definitely does impact the flavor of the meat as well as the texture. It's not mushy um, like those conventional birds that don't really have room to move around. Our birds are out on pasture, they're chasing bugs and grasshoppers and foraging, and so they're using their muscles so it has texture to it. So this is kind of the best of both worlds. There's still a lot of hard work in the days to come, but for Mandy, it's all worth it. I didn't plan to do this. <laughs> I, I loved the profession. I very much loved um, to do this, but I think farms like ours are important because they provide an alternative to big ag farming. And we've been very transparent from the beginning in sharing you know, our motivations toward this, and customers receive that. Well, they are looking for a farmer who allows them to eat with a clear conscience. <laughs> and we provide that for them. To learn more about Schacht Farm or to join their CSA, visit schachtfarm.com. Well, Annie, I don't know about you, but I love hearing those birds. <laughs> Amazing. Their little squabble is like so infectious. 
Well, they don't just have cute birds on their farm. The shacks practice sustainable agriculture. Can you give us, like, can you shed some light on what sustainable agriculture is? Sure, I'm not sure uh, specifically how shack defines it, because I think every farm defines it a little bit differently. But you can think of sustainable agriculture in terms of how the growing practices impact the environment, the land, the water, the air. And then you can also think of sustainability in terms of your carbon footprint. How much fossil fuel does it take to get your food from seed to my plate? So in, in that case, we're talking about sustainability in terms of people growing food for people who live close to them on a small scale and doing it without pesticides and herbicides. And you know, one thing that I love about this book is that you do talk to professional chefs and you talk to career farmers, but you're also talking to just sort of regular folks who have good ideas. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, what we can learn from them. You know, those stories are some of my favorites in the book. We all have a personal food story. And I think it takes one moment in our lives to have a personal connection to food. Maybe it's going out and hunting for morels. Maybe it's discovering you have the 60 foot persimmon tree in your backyard, but we have a connection to some part of our food life and then suddenly the world is a different place. And a lot of the stories in the book that I collected from just regular people like you and me uh, just really felt like that. It felt like a revelation. Well, it does make the book feel very real for sure. Well, Andy introduced us to one local gardener featured in the book who shows you just how much you can do with sustainable gardening in a small environment. <laughs> Many Hoosiers are busy preparing for their summer harvest, and with the ever-increasing focus on sustainability, many city residents are coming up with their own unique solutions for a green garden. Yeah, that one goes way back. Right, and so those ones will feed into here, and the ones come around the house. You know, through the right turnings of valves, you can send water from the garage to the garden, water from the house to the garden. Okay. So this one opens things up to the garden. And so now if we open up the garage, all of the gardens are getting watered at a furious rate. After moving to Bloomington to pursue a doctorate degree, Stephen Janowicki decided to use his understanding of engineering and a bit of ingenuity to construct his very own watering system. So I have six rain barrels around the house. They're all 55 gallon barrels. Um, they're all fed by my house roof and the garage roof, which has about 1,500 square feet of collecting area. So I can hold 300 gallons of water, which will last a week or two in the summertime. So the rain barrels are all connected with a PVC pipe, and then that PVC pipe has a valve that connects it to all the rain barrels. That PVC pipe connects to a valve that connects it to all the garden beds. So in about five minutes, I can dump like 25 gallons of water evenly distributed across the whole garden. But he didn't stop there. When it's especially rainy and the garden doesn't need watering, Stephen has devised a way to use the excess water for something a little bit different. I uh, realized that I probably don't need to have a toilet that has sanitized chlorinated water in it because of what you usually do with the water in the toilet. So I uh, ran a pipe in from the outside rain barrels through the crawl space and into the toilet. It has a little bit of a different color than city water. Um, it has a sort of very light tea-ish shade to it, like a very light white tea. Um, but uh, no, no smells or anything so far. From it takes a little while to fill. The pressure is pretty low from the barrels. but. Uh, if, you're, if you don't mind waiting a few minutes between flushes, uh, you can flush water for free. And it's not just the water conservation that is saving Stephen money. He's got a whole flock of eager helpers ready to lend a hand, or rather, beak, with the gardening. Everybody in Bloomington should have chicken. Uh, yeah, there's no reason not to. Bloomington has a, a chicken permit that you have to apply for. A permit, permit to harbor a chicken flock is the official title. I have mine up in my fridge. You have to have an inspector from the animal department come out and check your coop to make sure that it's big enough, that it's safe enough, that it meets the criteria that the city thinks are good for birds, which are pretty good criteria for birds. The only weird thing about the chicken permit process is that there's a requirement that the city has that your chicken coop not be visible to roads. You have to have a shrub or a fence or some kind of visibility screen around the coops. As long as you have a safe place for the chickens to live and they have enough room to roam around, uh, there's no reason not to. Uh, the different things are they're not so different. Being a grad student is a lot like being an amateur engineer and building things. I mean, it's, it's all problem solving and it's all seeing a situation that is you know, needing a solution and finding that solution. Well, after all those beautiful vegetables come up in the garden, many folks might wonder, now what? 
but the Earth Eats book features a lot of tasty recipes that are quick and easy and make good use of those veggies. So, Annie, how did you choose the recipes that went into the book? Well, first of all, I spoke with the chefs because they're the experts, right? Chefs like Seth Elger here of No Coast Reserve. And really what we wanted to try to do in the book is give you recipes that are easy and they're quick, they're going to be delicious, and they're maybe a gateway to doing some more difficult recipes down the road. So I think what we've got today is a pretty good example of that. Yeah, yeah. Seth, what are we making today? Uh, we're making taqueria pickles. What are taqueria pickles? <laughs> so uh, traditionally in uh, more authentic uh, Mexican style taquerias, you're given a pickled side. Uh, tacos tend to be kind of heavy and a little bit fatty and having something with some acidity uh, helps break up the monotony. All uh, right. Yeah. So what are the components here? We've got onions, carrots, uh, also some jalapeno. Uh, we make a brine with sliced garlic, bay leaves, uh, black peppercorns, and Mexican oregano. Uh, we dilute it down with a little bit of water, but it's got uh, salt dissolved in there as well. Sounds like we have the lay of the land, so why don't we yeah. go ahead and start making it? Show us what to do. Sure thing. Transfer our onions here. And these look like just kind of a rough chop. It doesn't doesn't really matter how you cut them, or uh, no. The larger the piece of vegetable is, the longer it's going to take to pickle. Okay. So something like this needs to set three to seven days uh, to pickle. Okay. To where it's noticeable. All right. Or you can cut it smaller, like this is, and you can maybe get it done in two or three days. Do you cut it small like that with a knife, or do you use a special tool? Uh, yeah, knife. Okay. <laughs> no one should be afraid of the knives. They have <laughs> All right, we got some delicious looking carrots going in there. And some jalapeno as well. But the seeds in the pith are out of those, so will these not be spicy pickles? Not as spicy. You can okay. leave the seeds in if you want them uh, to be a little bit spicier. I just find in the restaurant, it's best to err on the, the gringo side of things. And then when people <laughs> want spicy, then you, you can add that on We the are side. in Indiana. <laughs> exactly. So uh, being that this is gonna get put into a jar, and the brine poured in on top of it, you do want to mix your vegetables up just so you evenly distribute everything. Right. And then you just transfer to the jar. Okay. You always want to make sure your jars are nice and clean and sterilized as well, being that this is not getting pressure cooked. Sure. Uh, this is just going to sit in the refrigerator. Okay. For a couple of days, and then it is ready to rock and roll. Delicious. So a couple days in the fridge, that's it. We're not pressure canning these. No, not at all. Very easy. <laughs> all right. So you fill it all the way up to the top? Yeah, just, just under the neck of okay. the jar. All right. And then if you've got a strainer at home, you can, you can strain this brine so as well. So what's in this brine? Sliced garlic, black peppercorns. There's also Mexican oregano uh, and salt dissolved okay. in there also. All right. Just the go. recipe calls for uh, the infusion for about an hour just so you get the flavors in the vinegar. I see. Okay. That looks good. So there must be a ton of flavor in that brine. Oh, yes. <laughs> and then we seal our jar and into the fridge it goes. Do you have to shake it or agitate it or anything uh, like that? Every couple of days, I always mess with them a little bit, but I don't think there's really any call for it. I okay. think it's more busybody. Okay. Uh, OCD. And could you put this, um, these pickles on any sort of taco, or is there a certain protein they work with? Oh, they work with everything. Uh, on the east side, at our original location, we used to do uh, grilled fish tacos okay. with this. I make this at home and serve it up with grilled steak. Uh, doesn't matter. If it's Mexican or, or Hispanic at all in theme, uh, this is going to work. All right. Well, while we've got here, well, got you here, I have to ask you, what are some of your favorite tips for using seasonal ingredients? I think you just, you can't be afraid. Okay. You go to the farmer's market or you get your, your CSA share in, uh, be bold. You know, look up if you need uh, help on a recipe, uh, go to the Earth Eats Cookbook <laughs> or uh, any other number of, of wonderful online resources. Uh, just find someone who, who knows what they're doing with the ingredient and, and go for it. Be bold. I like yeah. that. Well, Seth, thank you so much for being with us today and cooking this ama or preparing this, um, these amazing pickles. And you can learn more about Chef Seth's story, see his latest menus, and make reservations at nocoastreserve.com. Well, for home cooks looking to learn new techniques, Mother Hubbard's Cupboard offers free classes but their mission goes a lot further, providing access to healthy whole foods to all. 
in 1998, there were two young women who were experiencing some food insecurity in their own houses, having a challenge feeding their own families. So they decided to start a food pantry that was really more than a food pantry, but somewhere where folks could get high quality, healthy food. And written into the values was health and sustainability. So it wasn't just about food assistance. It wasn't just about getting calories. From the very beginning, community was at the heart of the work of Mother Hubbard's Cupboard. And because we were started, by folks that were needing the services, there wasn't a boundary between those who were stocking the shelves um, and those who were receiving groceries. And I think coming out of that founding of dignity at the base of all that Mother Hubbard's Cupboard does, um, it led to a different kind of organization. We work on the honor system. Instead of requiring paperwork and bank statements and IDs, if you come into Mother Hubbard's Cupboard, we trust you. We trust that your family is in need of support. The food pantry is only one part of what we do here at Mother Hubbard's Cupboard. Our Community Food Resource Center has a classroom, it has community gardens. They all work together to build community food security and a stronger food system in Bloomington and in our region. The gardens are more about education than production at this point. It's really fun when you're talking to somebody about what to do with a, a certain ingredient in the pantry and you say, oh, that'd be really great with some basil. Oh, hey, we've got some in the garden. Why don't you come on out and we can show you where it is and how to harvest it. We're able to connect people directly with the experience of growing and actually, you know, um, learn as they're helping us to grow food. We've always tried to be giving away resources that will help people grow food at home. About a third of our patrons report growing at home. So um, it's really important to us to be able to provide as many plants and pots and soils and you know, seeds and, and knowledge. The how-to is, is really huge, of course. So a few years ago, Mother Hubbard's Cupboard was able to start a tool share program. And this basically is a lending library of kitchen and garden equipment. You basically sign up for a library card and patrons are welcome to borrow anything free of charge. Non-patrons are just welcome to make a small donation and you know sign up um, just the same as anybody else. And it's really great. You can borrow things like a brat fork or a tiller. On the kitchen side of things, you could borrow a pizza stone or you could borrow a food processor. And then you know we've got a lot of opportunities for people to drop in and ask questions. And having an on-site kitchen where, like say, we have weekly kids cook programming. Kids will come in with their families and they usually start by going out to the garden to harvest something, then they'll come inside and make it all together and then eat it together as a group. And then if there's time and, and some food left over, some of the kids will often demonstrate out, out in the pantry. So having all of these things located in one space, our education programs, I think, really provide a space for people to come together around food. They're going in, they're preparing and the eating of it. Classes like our bread baking class or our wild edibles class are happening at the same time that the food pantry is open. Every part of our program, from tasting to growing to using the food pantry services, all of those programs are working at the same time. Really the most important thing about having cooking and gardening is that Social isolation is one of the um, symptoms of experiencing poverty and food insecurity. So the more that we can, as folks are using our food pantry, offer opportunities to get to know other people, to spend time in the garden together, the more that we're meeting that goal of building community. A lot of patrons come and volunteer with us and come and serve in the food pantry and in the gardens and with, with our classes. So this creates an environment where it's not just people who are giving and people who are taking. It's allowing for everybody to come and be involved with dignity. And you'll see people from all different ages and all different backgrounds all working side by side and teaching each other and it's really amazing. I love the fact that we create a space that people want to come and be a part of and that as time goes by, we just see this community grow and grow. And it's because it's, it's you know, a dignified space and it recognizes that we all deserve beautiful things and healthful food. To learn about upcoming workshops or to get involved with Mother Hubbard's Covered, visit their website, mhcfoodpantry.org. And to read more about Mother Hubbard's Covered, 
To get recipes and gardening tips and more, you can purchase the Earth Eats book at iupress.indiana.edu. Well, Annie, thanks again for being on the show, for giving us a peek into this cookbook. Um, you know, I'm really excited about all of the recipes that will give me an excuse to tinker on in the kitchen a little bit more, yeah. but I love the stories that really show how local food brings a community together. Yeah, local healthy food is for everyone. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better. Well, thank you so much. That's all the time that we've got for tonight. Thanks again. Good night. Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you.